Oh, good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining. It's an honor for us to get you as a special guest. It's a pleasure to be with you. Sir, in your article published in July in the Washington Post, you wrote that Putin has three ways, three choices how to proceed with regard to Ukraine. He could pursue an accommodation with Ukraine by terminating the assault on its sovereignty and economic well-being. Putin could continue to sponsor a thinly willed military intervention designed to disrupt life in portions of Ukraine. Putin could invade Ukraine, exploiting Russia's much larger military potential. Well, now, after more than three months have passed since the time of your article publication, what do you see? What path has Putin chosen? Well, first of all, I can't categorically say what path he has chosen because he normally does not confide in me and he normally does not get advice from me. But I would say in response to those three alternatives that the most likely at the moment is the second one, a kind of harassment, maybe in the hope that eventually there will be some accommodation and the Ukrainians as part of it will accept the incorporation of Crimea into Russia in exchange for the previous frontiers or the legal frontiers. Or he might actually uh, choose the first one, uh, but knowing that that is, of course, an increasingly risky and potentially costly uh, policy to pursue. Well, and what are the possible ways for the Ukraine? Uh, what would you advise us? What should be prepared for and how to get prepared? I think, I'm sure most of you realize this, but I think Ukraine is really at a critically important historical moment. Will it succeed in defining itself as a European, a democratic nation dedicated to its freedom, dedicated to such an extent that anyone who wishes to raise their hand against your freedom knows that they're running a very major risk? I think that has to be very clear to all concerned. That certainly was not clear after the resistance-free Russian occupation of Crimea. I think it has become more the signal now, more the symbol, in view of the efforts to redeem some of the territory in the Donbass area. But there are still some uncertainties as to the extent of Ukrainian commitment to long-term freedom and independence and democracy. And democracy, in turn, also means a law-abiding system, not one dominated by corruption, as has been the case in Ukraine, and incidentally, as is also very much the case in Russia. So Ukraine has to prove that it really is determined to be free and to be an enduring part of the European picture. But if Ukraine succeeds in doing this, something else just as important will develop. The only subsequent prospect for Russia will be to accommodate to that reality and eventually to become itself a part of Europe. If it doesn't do that, it will end up being an impoverished satellite of China. And I don't think that is a very good prospect for Russia. Sir, you told that we have to prove, but to be honest, Ukraine lost its historical chance, uh, for example, in 91st, when Ukraine declared independence, but didn't change the system and has become one of the main examples of the corruption. And, well, after the Orange Revolution, when the country wasn't, wasn't able to join EU and NATO, also the country was invited to join, uh, well, here now, it's been already half a year of a new government but oh, there were no reforms. Do you have a feeling that we're losing the third chance? You may be losing some of the momentum. You're certainly losing gradually some of the fervor that arose with the assertion of independence, which is symbolized by Maidan. But I'm still optimistic. At the same time, in being optimistic, I have to speak in a frank manner to my Ukrainian friends, and you all know that I am an old friend of Ukraine, you have to be prepared for a long period of intense effort and sacrifice and self-discipline and law-abiding systems. And you have to extirpate, eliminate the corruption that has so demoralized not only your economics or your daily routines, but it even demoralized your armed forces. 
That has been a tragic, tragic development after the gaining of independence some 20 years ago. And now you have to face the fact that for the next 10 years or so, you'll really have to make dedicated sacrifices. But once you do, you will be a part of Europe. You will be very successful in Europe. You have all the potential for being successful, because you are Europeans. Well, speaking about the present position of the U.S. administration, is it not a sign that the country has ceased to be a global leader? You even wrote a book once about the choice for the country global domination or global leadership. And now sanctions are ineffective, only defensive weapons for Ukraine and not clear when. The United States came out with dignity out of many difficult situations from Cuban Missile Crisis to the Cold War. On your point of view, why is America so indecisive now? I don't agree with your question. The premise of your question is that America is indecisive. Look, the coalition of the West that's imposing increasingly painful sanctions on Russia has own, its own internal differences. And we were ahead of everyone. And it was the president of the United States, Obama, who said, I will stand by Ukraine. And we have succeeded in mobilizing European support. You now have Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, taking a really tough stance. You have other European countries that are very committed to you. I think you're doing well. The point is, however, that it's up to you to assert your desire to be independent, not for us to prop it up or to push you forward. You have to set the pace. And I think you are, as of now, demonstrating an increasingly widespread realization that you have to do this assertively, on a wide basis, and for a long time to come. And then you'll be successful. This is not going to be a quick, instant victory, an instant miracle. Well, but about your phrase, oh, the phrase uh, which have become a classic, without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire, with Ukraine, the same suborned and then subordinated, Russia is automatically converted into an empire. How do you think, is it still so? I would, aim, I would change my formulation somewhat, <laughs> in the sense that I think it may try to be an empire, but it's going to be a failure as an empire. Because the fact of the matter is that Russia's treatment of Ukraine has made many people in Belarus very uncomfortable about their future if they become too closely subordinated to Russia. Look at how the Kazakhs reacted. The Kremlin, that Western Kazakhstan is heavily inhabited by Russians. Every Kazakh immediately thought of Crimea when they heard that. I don't think the emerging quote-unquote empire is going to be all that successful. The empire would only be successful if Russia manages to subordinate Ukraine. And yet that is proving to be too difficult because of the new mood in Ukraine and because the West is indicating quite clearly that it is not indifferent. But don't expect the West to do the fighting for you. That's a key point you have to realize. You have to be willing to do what is necessary to protect your freedom. And then one way or another, the support of the West will be there and it will escalate. Many years back, you predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union. Speaking about Putin's regime and Russia in general, how strong is the country and how strong is the regime? I think the country has been weakened. The regime is relatively strong, but unless it has successes, which are defined as truly significant improvements in the living conditions of Russian society, it's not going to be very effective. And I think this is the challenge that Putin is facing. And I hope he realizes, and if he does not, that his successors do realize, that Europe will want Russia in it. After Ukraine enters Europe, we will welcome Russia also in Europe. And Russia inevitably will be a much more promising country than if it becomes dependent on its neighbor in the East, who has its own ambitions, economic, geopolitical, even territorial. Thank you so much for joining us. You are a legend. I was enormously happy to have you as a special guest. Thank you so much, sir.
Well, thank you so much, and thank you for letting me address not only you, but your colleagues and your countrymen, to whom I wish all the best. And in wishing them all the best, I want to say without any hypocrisy, I also wish the Russian people all the best, because the Russian people deserve a better government than they currently have.